Okay, well, here we are. Welcome to Breaking Dimension. Okay, thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. yeah, loud and clear. Okay, so looking at psychedelic drugs and human rights, sacramental freedom and cognitive liberty. Um, and just to say at the start that this paper was written in collaboration with Casey Hardison, um, whose image is on this blotter art here. And Casey can't be with us today, though he'd dearly love to be because he's languishing in Wellingborough Nick, um, which I'll say more about later. Um, and if I can give a, a shameless uh, plug, we're selling um, signed copies of uh, this blotter art signed by Sasha and Anne Shulgin um, just outside the doors here through uh, uh, blotterart.co.uk. We're, we're raffling them off for £10 a raffle ticket to help fund uh, his uh, legal cases. So if anyone wants one, uh, please go and buy one. OK, so back to my talk. Uh, so looking at the, uh, the legal meaning of psychedelics, and so we're looking at the meaning of psychedelics in this symposium. So considering this from a legal perspective, and as you're no doubt all aware, under the main piece of drugs legislation in, in this country, under the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971, many psychedelics are viewed as class A drugs, as um, the most dangerous drugs. And what I want to argue here is that we can potentially use another piece of our drugs legislation, uh, namely the European Convention on Human Rights, to accord psychedelics a very, very different meaning, um, whether that be as sacraments or as catalysts to powerfully important alternative states of consciousness. And as the name suggests, and as you already know, the European Convention on Human Rights protects our human rights. And this is really, really important when you're dealing with minority groups. It helps to shield them from the, the tendency of democracies to veer towards mob rule if we don't kind of ring fence minority, minority rights. Um, and this quote by Beck speaking to this, saying that rights by their nature are designed to trump consequentialist, utilitarian or majoritarian uh, considerations. Obviously, drug users are not a minority group. That's practically everybody on the planet. Um, but psychedelic drug users are a minority group. Not here, obviously, but, uh, but generally, <laughs> psychedelic drug users are, are a minor minority group. But regardless of numbers, numbers shouldn't matter when we're talking about human rights. Um, so this quote from Husak saying, even if only one person wanted to use LSD and no one else wanted to allow him or her to do so, its prohibition would require a justification. The only acceptable answer to the why his or her preference and not mine question requires a principle that cites a morally relevant difference between the permissible and the prohibited. So I want to focus on one particular element of the European Convention, so namely to focus on Article 9, which protects our right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. Uh, and this right includes freedom to manifest religion or belief in worship, teaching, practice and observance. And obviously there's, there's uh, great potential for conflict between 
the Misuse of Drugs Act prohibitions and the European Convention on Human Rights because of the fact that, that, that as you're aware, that drug use and religious practices have been inextricably entwined through the ages. Um, and this is a quote from uh, Robert Forte, who I believe is at the conference. I don't know if he's in the room. Um, so saying that for as long as we know of, there have been at least a few people in every culture, the mystics and the saints, who were able through prayer, meditation or other techniques to bring upon themselves mystical states of consciousness, also called primary religious experience. And in some cultures, this direct experience of the sacred was available to everyone through the sacramental use of psychoactive plants and preparations. So we have this kind of conflicting situation where to, what to one person is a dangerous drug, to another person is a religious sacrament, the prohibition of which could potentially be conceived of as a form of religious persecution. Since, uh, since it's been incorporated into our domestic law in 1998, since the European Convention has been incorporated into our domestic law, the courts are under a duty to try and read other legislation so as to be compatible with the European Convention so far as is possible. And so I want to look at some, some cases which have challenged um, the kind of the fit between the Misuse of Drugs Act and the European Convention. And I want to look first of all at a case from the UK um, where the argument that the Misuse of Drugs Act conflicted uh, with Article 9 freedoms was raised, the case of Taylor. Um, it involved cannabis, so I hope you don't mind if I treat cannabis as a, a kind of honorary psychedelic here. And the facts of Taylor were that Taylor was arrested entering a Rastafarian uh, temple with 90 grams of cannabis. And he admitted that he was intending to supply it um, to others because for some Rastafarians, it's customary to, to smoke cannabis whilst reading the Bible in the belief that this pursuit kind of brings them closer to Jah. Um, and at trial, the courts accepted this argument. They accepted that Article 9 of the European Convention was engaged. And so the Rastafarian meaning given to cannabis of being a, a, sacri a sacrament um, as against simply a Class B drug was, was accepted by the courts. Um, but Taylor was caught by Article 9.2. Um, because whilst the right to freedom of religion is absolute, um, there are caveats attached to the right to be able to practice your freedom of religion. So the ways in which it can permissibly be manifested. Um, so practices might be curtailed if, for instance, they're seen to threaten health or morals, whatever that is taken to mean. Um, and 9-2 was seen to, to kick in here, so this qualifier was seen to, to, to kick in, uh, meaning that it was acceptable to prohibit Taylor's activity. One of the things that's interesting is that Taylor was being prosecuted for intent to supply, not just for simple possession. And so what we don't know is would Article 9-2 have been engaged if Taylor had argued for his sacramental right to use cannabis and it was simple possession. And I think that's a potentially interesting case for the future and it would be an interesting challenge for somebody uh, to make. Um, the court in Taylor uh, placed heavy reliance on the international context. So they looked at the fact that the UK are signed up to the three UN drug conventions that comprise uh, the system of global prohibition. And they saw global prohibition as trumping religious freedom. Um, and the Court of Appeal refused Taylor leave to appeal against his sentence, uh, against his conviction, saying that the single convention on narcotic drugs recognises that addiction to narcotic drugs constitutes a serious evil for the individual and is fraught with economic danger to mankind. And I think, note the hyperbolic use of language here. Um, I mean, the, the term addiction is a, is, a, is a contested concept. It's particularly a contested concept in the context of cannabis. And cannabis certainly isn't a narcotic. Um, and terms like serious evil. Um, and I'm going to look more at the, the discourse in drug cases in the courts um, as I progress, because I think that the role that language plays in creating our world is crucial and, and is crucial in kind of keeping this prohibitionist paradigm uh, going. I also think, I think that this reliance on the UN drug conventions by our domestic courts is legally unconvincing. Um, unlike the European Convention, the, the global drug conventions are not incorporated into our domestic law, so they therefore should have a lower status than, than conventions that are incorporated into our domestic law. And also the drug conventions do allow for exemptions on constitutional and human rights based grounds. They allow for that, um, such as are created by the, by the existence of Article 9. 
And also the fact that the conventions aren't set in stone. Um, and Amanda Fielding, who's going to be talking after me, is talking about the Beckley Foundation's proposals for a new draft convention. Um, so uh, this idea that we're, we're not kind of um, irreparably bound to these conventions. Um, and there's an argument that ironically adherence to the conventions has become a form of religion in itself, which is what this uh, quote from Cohen um, looks at, saying that whatever the origin of the UN drug treaties and whatever the official rhetoric about their functions, the best way to look at them now is as religious texts. They have acquired a pattern of intrinsic and unquestioned value, and they have attracted a clique of true believers and proselytes to promote them. They pursue a version of humankind for whom abstinence from certain drugs is dogma, in the same way as other religious texts might prohibit certain foods or activities. The UN drug treaties thus form the basis of the international drug prohibition church. Belonging to the church has become an independent source of security and fighting the church's enemies has become an automatic source of virtue. There's a strong sense in the UK, I think, that one of the, the primary reasons that the courts and the state are so keen to abide by the UN drug conventions is because of fear of what the United States, as both the, the instigators and the guardians of global prohibition, what they would do if we didn't, of potential economic and, um, and political consequences. So... On that basis, it's, it's revelatory to have a look at what the US are doing um, in this field. And it, it, was, um, it was looked at briefly um, in the spirit molecule last night, and I just want to, to touch on a, a few issues from there again. Um, and religious freedom is enshrined within the, um, the First Amendment to the Constitution in, in the US, as well as being reaffirmed by the Religious Freedom Restoration Act 1993. Um, and they mentioned in the Spirit Molecule film last night the, the, um, the case involving the, one of the syncretic ayahuasca churches, the, uh, the UDV church, and the fact that they were being uh, prosecuted for using uh, the ayahuasca brew that, as you know, contains uh, DMT, which is a scheduled, the equivalent of a Class A drug in the States. And the church, um, the church there argued that to prohibit them from being able to drink uh, their ayahuasca during their ceremonies interfered with their religious freedom. And the Supreme Court ex accepted this. They accepted the fact that it would be um, an incursion into their religious freedom. So the meaning given to ayahuasca by the UDV church was given precedence over the meaning given to DMT by the, the US's uh, prohibitive system. So it was exempted from the usual prohibitive constraints. And what's interesting is that the US placed absolutely no reliance on the UN conventions. They, they said that they weren't engaged, they weren't significant enough to even really discuss in the case. So we're kind of overly relying on them, I think, when even the guardians don't even uh, see them as binding in this, um, in this area. And um, this isn't the only instance where religious freedom it has won out over drug prohibition in the, um, in the United States. Peyote use is also protected for all members of every recognised uh, Native, American, Na Native American tribe. But interestingly, the approach, um, this approach isn't extended to purported <laughs> sacramental use of cannabis. Um, and this has been, in, been tested in a couple of cases in the US, but the courts have distinguished between cannabis use and something like peyote use, for instance, due to the fact that, that peyote is typically used in, in limited quantities within specific ceremonies, whereas something like Rastafari cannabis use, for example, is much more all-pervasive. Um, and so the, the courts kind of take the view that what they call abuse of peyote, so basically meaning taking it outside of a designated ritualised setting, um, is far less common than abuse of cannabis. Um, so in other words, it, it, it concerns about p political concerns about containment. Um, but again, even in the cannabis cases, there's no mention of the international conventions as creating some kind of insurmountable barrier. So it isn't something that they're, that they're relying on. So you can see that whether or not the kind of the religious adherents or people who are advocates of the Church of Prohibition um, get their meaning to, uh, to be uh, given precedence is, is culturally contingent. And it's also drug specific. You know, it varies from drug to drug within the same country. To illustrate this further, um, moving back to Europe, um, thinking about the way in which this has been dealt with in Italy, um, 
And as general background information, in Italy, possession of cannabis un under a certain amount, so if you've got one gram or under a small amount, um, are treated uh, using only administrative sanctions. And then there are, there are fixed thresholds over which you're deemed to be dealing, and then the criminal law will kind of kick in. So it's kind of effectively uh, decriminalised for possession. Um, and in 2008, an Italian um, Rastafarian was sentenced to 16 months in prison for intent to supply, having been caught with 97 grams of cannabis. And this case, case made its way to the Italian Supreme Court um, and relied upon Article 9 of the ECHR, so actually relying on Article 9 um, and the fact that his uh, cannabis was for religious use. And the Italian Supreme Court reversed the lower court's conviction, and they allowed for special dispensation of whether or not rasters are treated as dealing or being in simple possession. So basically, that if, if a Rastafarian is caught with, uh, with relatively large quantities of cannabis, then the courts are much more likely to still just treat that as possession, in other words, to ignore it. Um, and in reaching their decision, the Supreme Court noted that uh, Rastafarians smoked cannabis in the belief that, that, that it grew on, the plant grew on the tomb of King Solomon. And they acknowledged that Rastafarians use cannabis, and, and I quote from the Supreme Court, saying that not only as a medical, but also as a meditative herb, and as such, it is a possible bearer of the psychophysical state to contemplation and prayer. And for those of us who were in the cannabis workshop yesterday, um, there were uh, Rastafarian people talking about that experience. Um, also in Europe, obviously, in the, in the Netherlands, the courts have allowed a religious exemption for the Dutch Santo Daime Church to use ayahuasca um, in the, the Feynman case, again, specifically relying on the protection of, of freedom of religion in Article 9. And the expert toxicologist in that case testified that there were no scientific grounds for DMT to be considered as a, as a hard drug, um, noting that it's found in mammalian breast milk and naturally synthesised in the brain. And they also said there were no public health considerations concerning use of ayahuasca. And that the reason that DMT had been scheduled in Holland was purely for political reasons. It was simply because we were expected to under the UN conventions. There was no other real reason. And so for those reasons, um, the, the conventions were seen as kind of subsidiary to the Article 9 protection of freedom of religion in this case. The, D the Dutch court accepted these arguments um, and they thought that it would be an infringement that wouldn't be kind of valid in a free democratic society to stop ayahuasca use. So it's clear that the Europe the European Convention certainly hasn't been used to its full potential in this sphere of creating religious exemptions in, in the UK. Um, and when I, was, um, when I was teaching yoga this morning, there's a, a couple of people in there who, who were talking about the case of the people from the um, Santo Daime church who've been arrested in, in Devon, I think that's right. And, and, um, and, and maybe that will be the case by which we can um, create these kinds of exemptions in, in this country. You know, I think the field is still is still open for this. I don't think it's been closed down. But, um, however, it's also my contention that it's deeply problematic to only exempt certain kinds of drug taking from prohibition because they fit in with an, uh, with a, a, an accepted religious framework. Um, and this quote from Bacalar and Grinspoon kind of gets to the heart of this. And uh, again, those of us who were at the, the cannabis workshop yesterday, there's a fantastic Skype presentation from Lester Grinspoon, a uh, quote from him. So saying that the drug must be not only religiously important to its user, but also an essential part of a traditional right of communal significance. It is as though mountain climbing were regarded as generally so dangerous and useless that climbers would be fined and jailed unless they could prove they were making a pilgrimage to a holy site on the peak certified by an established church. Um, and so the fact that, that religion can be conceptualised as a web of meaning, a, a system of belief through which we try and make sense of our lives, we try and make sense of the world, we try and find answers to existential questions. And all of us have such a framework, regardless of whether or not we would categorise ourselves as, as religious or not. Um, and to my mind, there is a lack of a binary distinction between the sacred and the profane. And I think that one of the things that psychedelic drugs do is they fudge that kind of interface between the two um, even further. Some people might take drugs to reinforce the religious paradigms that they live by, but many people take psychedelics with a view to blowing them apart. Um, 
which is what this quote from Terence McKenna is, is getting at. So saying that the psychedelics are a red-hot social ethical issue because they are deconditioning agents. They will raise doubts in you if you're a Hasidic rabbi, a Marxist anthropologist, or an altar boy, because their business is to dissolve belief systems. And, and quite a few of the speakers earlier today, so, uh, so Mike Jay and, and Andy Letcher, have been looking at the fact that we, we create our own meanings when when it comes to psychedelics. And I absolutely concur with that. I think as with life, we, we invest them with, with our own meaning. And I think the issue is who gets to say which psychedelic experiences are meaningful and thereby worthy of protection and which are not and therefore subject to prosecution. Okay, okay so um, again, this is one that I think that can be addressed in the courts, again, relying on Article 9, because Remember that Article 9 goes beyond protecting religious freedom and it also covers freedom of, it also covers freedom of thought, um, to which the caveats in Article 9.2 don't apply. So the right to freedom of thought is absolute. And this aspect of Article 9 was significant in the, in the case of Casey Hardison, which is, is what I want to uh, move on to looking at. And um, Casey was prosecuted for production of LSD, 2CB, DMT and, uh, and other psychedelic drugs. And he argued at trial that prohibiting him from having lawful access to these substances interfered with his Article 9 right to freedom of thought, with his cognitive liberty. And his logic was that psychedelic drugs are an important technology. They, they act as catalysts through which our consciousness can be modified and we can access um, different states of consciousness. Cognitive liberty is the freedom to absolute sovereignty over our own consciousness. And in the words of Richard uh, Glenn Boyer, saying that the right to control one's own consciousness is the quintessence of freedom. If freedom is to mean anything, it must mean at a minimum that each person is free to direct one's own consciousness, one's own underlying mental processes, and one's beliefs, opinions, and worldview. And there's one way in which we can try and escape out of the, the kind of hall of mirrors that is quotidian um, everyday perception. Um, and so you, through this lens, you can see drug prohibition as, a, as, an, as an extremely pernicious form of censorship. So a censorship of consciousness itself. And by punishing individuals for choosing to experience, to enhance or to enable particular states of mind, the state has trespassed upon freedom of thought. And it can be likened to potentially having the wealth of, of human knowledge at your fingertips through the internet and the state applying some kind of filter, like a sort of psychopharmacological North Korea. Um, okay, so... Um, I think that cognitive liberty um, sits at the core of all other rights and freedoms. They're all meaningless if we don't also have cognitive liberty. And this quote from Ruiz Sierra, kind of looking at this and how this can help with the drug policy movement. Um, so saying that as a matter of conscience, a fundamental right to freedom of thought protects the autonomous modulation of consciousness through chemical means. It is by reframing what drug prohibition means that cognitive liberty makes its greatest contribution to the drug policy reform movement. Cognitive liberty as a concept exposes the argument that the drug policy reform movement has conspicuously shied away from making, namely that drug prohibition is untenable because it infringes freedom of thought. So to be clear, the issue isn't, is there a fundamental right to use drug X? It's rather, is there a fundamental right to control one's own consciousness? Um, Casey also argued that his, um, his Article 14 uh, rights had been breached, which is uh, protects us against discrimination. Our rights under the European Convention are meant to be uh, protected equally. Um, we shouldn't receive prejudicial treatment in comparison with analogous groups unless that unequal treatment is objectively and reasonably justified. And uh, throughout his defence, Casey was, was kind of arguing why it is that we pro prohibit um, certain drugs um, which pose far less harm than the harms posed by uh, drugs that are prolifically used, such as alcohol and tobacco. And these arguments are um, obviously backed up by the science. Um, this is a, this is a, a graph from, from Professor Nutt and it, looking at a harm matrix and kind of synthesising together all the available material. Um, and the, the red is harm to others, the blue is harm to, uh, to oneself. 
LSD way down at the bottom there, virtually nil in terms of, of, of um, harm to others, and alcohol, uh, the kind of the clear, the clear front runner here. And this harm matrix, which I think has been really kind of indispensable um, to the drug policy reform movement, uh, came out of some sad buildings. So. Um, so in terms of the fact that LSD is, is down here but receives kind of phenomenal sentences, it does kind of raise this idea that perhaps the purpose of the, you know, the, the, the purpose of the Misuse of Drugs Act is meant to be to protect society and to protect individuals from harm. And the fact that this isn't happening see, seems to imply that it's being used to police our states of consciousness. Okay. In spite of um, such scientific evidence, Casey's claim that uh, his human rights were engaged was dismissed uh, by the court and he received a 20-year sentence, um, which to my mind is so disproportionate as to engage Article 3 of the European Convention, which protects against inhuman and degrading treatment. Um, so just as a comparator, um, top Nazi Albert Speer, who was the Minister of um, War Production and Armaments for the Third Reich, received a 20-year sentence after his trial at Nuremberg. Um, in, in the same week that Casey was sentenced, uh, Kamal Borgas um, was convicted of terrorist offences, of um, conspiring to produce ricin, um, which he was going to uh, release on the London Underground, a poisonous toxin deliberately extracted to endanger human life, for which he got 17 years. Okay, so as I said, just to, to finish off looking at a couple of quotes, because I think one of the ways in which we, we justify what we do is obviously through our language. So looking at the language used in, in the courts and what the judiciary makes psychedelics mean, and therefore what people who make them who they are. Um, and this is from uh, the judge uh, who sentenced Casey, saying that the most serious element of this case is that you are not doing this for your own consumption or the good of mankind, but for greed, a human emotion that goes back to the dawn of time. And this is from uh, Lord Justice Keith, whilst refusing Casey leave to appeal, um, saying that he claimed to regard the bond between man and plant as a sacred one, although the prosecution was to say that his assertions about the benefits which he claims the use of such drugs generate was just an excuse for his commercial production of hard drugs on a large scale. So, um, to contrast, um, I'm pilfering a little bit from the release campaign there. Um, so, so, to contrast, this is uh, how Casey explained his decision to, uh, to make drugs. So, saying, so, why did I do it? There is no single pat answer. The simplest, my love of learning, the veiled for my ego, for the attention, to feel special, to be loved, etc. The flippant, because I could with hindsight, civil disobedience, academic and religious freedom in the study of the mind and an expression of equal rights. The most accurate, my desire to share in theogenesis with others, to wake humanity up from the penumbral dream world of materialist delusion, to help end the blatant injustice and rape of human dignity that occurs within the context of the war on some people who use some drugs, to seize the world stage and help create a forum for the cooperative and conscious stewardship of Mother Earth and all her relations. Uh, and that's quotes from a paper written by Casey that I have 50 copies of at the front if anyone wants to grab a copy or you can access it online from his uh, website. Um, so, give you a better view of the picture because it's always nice to see naked people making drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so just to, just to sum up then, um, so, so to finish, as, as you know, this conference is called Breaking Convention, and my argument is that the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971, as it's currently applied, breaks the European Convention on Human Rights in a number of different ways. On a more optimistic note, I also think that the scope to use the European Convention to evolve the Misuse of Drugs Act is far from exhausted. Um, so a look at developments in other nations has shown that there is room for religious exemptions um, with the courts in a number of countries delineating a, a legal space for use of drugs in a variety of religious settings. In parallel with this are the therapeutic exemptions, which I haven't, I haven't had time to touch on here, but most strikingly the mushrooming of medical marijuana dispensaries um, in North America. Um, so I think that incremental gains are being made, and I think that chinks in the armour of prohibition are opening up. Um, and then just finally, to, to restate my belief that distinctions between the sacred and the profane uses of psychedelics are philosophically untenable. 
Um, and I think we should pursue our Article 9 rights beyond religious freedom, doggedly fighting for our right to cognitive liberty, and that that should ultimately undermine the prohibitive ideal.